Out of the Ordinary Insights, brought to you by Investec Specialist Bank. Captains of Industry. This week we're going to talk about fishing. We're going to talk about a company that's been a stalwart of the JSC since 1918. It's not the most glamorous company on the JSC, but it consistently returns good money to shareholders. In the studio with me, the Captains of Industry studio, is Francois Cuttle, who's the CEO of Oceana. Francois, thanks very much for joining us. You're a proper fisherman, aren't you? This isn't just uh, a CEO's job. You're not just a bean counter. Fishing is in your blood. No, whilst I am qualified as a bean counter, I did grow up in a fishing family. My father was a fisherman. Uh, he qualified as a lawyer, but he far, uh, soon went into the fishing game and he built up a big fishing company in South Africa, and that's what I grew up. I grew up around fishing boats. So this was uh, a different type of, of fishing environment. This was the 1960s from what you told me off air. Yeah, he, was, uh, he started off as a bit of a pioneer in the fishing industry here. Yeah, the industry was developing at that time and uh, he managed to find a niche for himself, developing new species. Uh, he was started off in the tuna business and the lobster business here in South Africa. Yeah, and then you of course took over because once you're in a fishing family, I've always found it's difficult to get away from fishing. It is, it uh, does sort of take you in. It's you know, the last sort of hunter-gatherer industry out there and uh, it's quite exciting. Um, but it has become a very capital intensive and can be quite a marginal business and so you've got to you've got to understand your cost base and you've got to understand your business. Yeah, we'll get to the mechanics of the business and how Oceana is doing at the moment and also the state of the South African fishing industry because there's a lot of controversy about it at the moment. But just go back to you. You went over to the United States of America, then you went to Alaska. You've had all sorts of different crisscross paths uh, around the globe in order to get you where you are today. Yeah, I've been I suppose I've been very fortunate coming from the background that uh, we did with my father having a fishing business here, we did emigrate to America. And at that time, Alaska was opening up as a, as a fishing uh, destination. And we invested as a family up there. And uh, I spent five years up on fishing boats and our processing ship in Alaska before coming back here to South Africa to work on a family investment we had up in Namibia. And uh, so I've been fortunate in being able to see fishing grounds around the world and different technologies and different uh, industries. Mm. Okay, so you're qualified, as you call it, a bean counter, or rather, as I called it, a bean counter. But you're, you're an accountant. But at the same time, what is good about this, I think, from Oceana's point of view, and previously INJ, is the fact that you've actually done the hard work as well and been out on boats and worked hard. And I suppose that has given you a really good grounding for the job you're, you're in at the moment. Yeah, you know, uh, fishing, uh, most a lot of companies make the mistake of forgetting that fishing is about just that, fishing. And uh, you've got to, the first principle is to be able to go out to sea and catch fish uh, uh, economically and to bring that to market economically. And, and so you've got to understand the kit and, and the cost base that you have at sea. Uh, and I suppose I've been lucky in, in being able to be part of that for a period of my career. Okay, now Oceana, before we get to when you joined, which as a CEO anyway, which was 2009, it's been going since 1918, and I hope you don't mind that I said it's not the most glamorous company on the JSC, but it's still there, that's the first thing, and secondly, it does return good money to shareholders. What's the history of the company? Yeah, the company started in 1918, as you say, actually in Lambert's Bay, and at that time it started in the lobster business. Uh, strangely enough, back in 1918, they were turning West Coast rock lobster into fish meal. Uh, obviously things have come along and Oceana has developed with the industry and is now quite a diversified fishing company. We have uh, involvements in a number of different sectors uh, and uh, the company's been listed and as you say it has done very well over a period of time, and an extended period of time. The operations, we know that uh, your uh, favourite brand, well one of your brands is a South African favourite, we saw it in the newspapers uh, very recently, uh, Lucky Star, but your other operations, give us a sort of a, a pie chart of what you do. Yeah, so Lucky Star and canned pilchards is an important part of our business, it's about 50% of our turnover, and to fuel that we have a cannery here on the west coast of South Africa and we have an investment in a cannery in Namibia. Uh, we also have a frozen pelagic business where we catch uh, a species called horse mackerel and we catch that in South Africa and Namibia and we export that into Africa. We do about 120,000 tonnes a year of that. Just we before you go on, why is this not a South African product? Why do we go for pilchards and sardines and West Africa and other parts of the continent go for horse mackerel? 
We do do some uh, horse mackerel here into the northern parts of, of South Africa, but it's, uh, I suppose it's, it's just a historical thing. You know, it's the pellet in South Africa has grown up around Lucky Star and canned fish. Uh, and certainly we want to take that into Africa because we think it has saliency into Africa. On the frozen side, uh, the rest of the African continent is used to eating fresh or frozen uh, product. Uh, and, and so we, that's where we see a huge amount of demand. Countries like the DRC, Angola, Cameroon, etc. Do you see that growing? Because the talk on CNBC Africa regularly is the emergence of Africa finally as an economic powerhouse. It's just started and it will go on in the future. Do you think that means an opening up of markets for you? Certainly. And, and, <coughs> and what has been interesting to see over a very short space of time is, is how the, the, the buying power within these markets has increased as those countries grow. You know, we certainly are playing in what I think is a very good space, which is affordable protein. Whilst we do do a small bit of lobster and some of the higher value items, the vast majority of our turnover comes through affordable protein, canned pulchards, frozen pelagics. And uh, we service a, an important part of the protein footprint here in, in South Africa and in Africa. And as people are moving up the economic scale, the demand for protein goes up and up. And we've seen that translate into more robust demand for our products over time. Let's compare you to, for example, chicken. I mean, you're both proteins, different tastes. Um, chicken is the protein of choice in South Africa, yeah. but is fish catching up or is it just going to stay where it is, do you think? We have seen over the past few years uh, growth in the amount of protein that is consumed in, in the space of pulchards, for example, but we are probably about one-tenth of what chicken is. We, uh, we've about People consume around four kilograms of pulchards per, per annum, a family, an average family in South Africa, where they're consuming over 38 kilograms of chicken per annum. So we've, we've got a lot of catch up to do, but we do think that there's opportunity there. Yeah, indeed. Uh, you were just talking about the, the lobster market and it was used as fertilizer because it was so abundant. In the newspaper this weekend, that I read anyway, there was a scandal about the way that South African stocks of lobster and also hake and also uh, pelagics and all sorts of other things are being mismanaged because of an anomaly or rather an oversight by the person that is in charge of fisheries in this country. What do you make of that? This is not a particularly political program, but you must have a view. Yeah, I think uh, you must be careful of, of, of reading too much into certain things. Certainly, South Africa has a long tradition of very good fisheries management. We've got great scientific uh, expertise uh, and we have a good legislative framework. The, the thing that you're talking about is specific to the West Coast rock lobster, where the West Coast rock lobster is at an area where it is challenged at the moment. And the vast majority of the challenge around that resource comes around an increase in the levels of poaching. And it's very difficult to manage that. And I know that government is, is, is struggling with that particular thing. But around the, the actual scientific research that is done, and the, the basic management re legislation in South Africa, we've got a very good framework around that. So the species like hake, horse mackerel, pulchards are, are, are very, you know, are very well managed. In fact, Oceana's basket of target species, uh, all of our target species, except now for West Coast rock lobster, on the sassy green list. Mm. What about quotas though? If I ever go down to Cork Bay and I buy as much as I can from uh, the smaller operators there, uh, hopefully the fish is fresh, I'm, I'm sure it is. They always complain to me, because I always have a chat with them, complain to me about the quota system, the fact that their lives are so tough. Do you think the quotas are too hard or do you think the quotas are appropriate for this country? No, I think quotas are, it's always a tough issue where you have a resource which is then allocated out everyone. I don't think there's any entity that will tell you that they have sufficient quota. Uh, everyone is jockeying for more quota at, at times. I think what you've got to look at is who translates that quota into the maximum economic benefit for all people. Not, personally, not just for the person that is harvesting the quota, but how far does it go? How far does it go into the community? How far does it go into the, gov the country's fiscus? And uh, it is a national resource. It has to be well and sustainably managed, which means it does have to have limitations. And in limitations, people will get disappointed. But I suppose the trick for government is to try and make sure that that resource is harvested to maximum effect, which is the maximum value creation that can happen 
out of that resource. And don't destroy the, you know, the, the crop itself, the catch itself, like, for example, in the North Sea, the cod has been overfished, for example, what the Spanish are complaining about at the moment in the dispute between Britain uh, over, over Gibraltar. The English are saying, or the British rather, are saying that they're overfishing. So it's a very fragile resource, isn't it? Correct. And it does have to be well and robustly managed. And as I say, in South Africa, there we have good examples of that. So the hake industry in South Africa was one of the first ground fish industries in the world that was certified by the Marine Stewardship Council as a sustainable fishery, which is a great tick for our scientific work and also for our, our management regime here, the fact that we do get certified uh, as, as sustainable. But against that, we've got the challenges of species like abalone. Now, abalone is, uh, you know, there's, there's not a significant barrier to entry for abalone fishing. You essentially need a screwdriver mm. and you can become an abalone fisherman. And so you have to create other barriers to stop people harvesting it. And unfortunately, we haven't been that good at stopping the poaching in this country. Back to the minister uh, and um, the way that the government is handling the business. There has been a scandal about uh, an 800 million uh, rand fleet management contract, I think it is, which is paralyze certain parts of the industry. Can you explain that? Yeah, the, the, this department, uh, DEF, doesn't actually run their own vessels. They have a number of vessels themselves which are under their management or under their guidance, and those include some research vessels and some patrol vessels. Uh, they outsourced that to a firm, which uh, the contract came up for renewal, I think it was about two years ago, and there was a new tender process. And it's that tender process that has received the spotlight. And uh, the par paralyzing of that tender process has meant that those boats have been tied up for a period of time. Um, and, but I do believe that uh, they will be being put to sea. The latest portfolio committee uh, government has indicated that they will be put to sea before the end of the year. And so we remain hopeful of that. Does it affect Oceana? It has affected us in the last two years because certainly the research element, we were very uh, keen to make sure that our research did not, uh, was not interrupted. We have, as I said, a history of good research here and we have data that goes back almost 50 years and you don't want to interrupt the collection of that data because the trends that come out of that are very important when it comes to fisheries management. So we have assisted by stepping in and providing some of our vessels to the government to, conduct, to take out the, the scientists to, uh, to do the scientific research. We cannot step in and do the patrol work. Clearly, you know, that would be the fox guard in the hen house. Yeah. But certainly on the research work, it's re really we've just been a taxi for the scientists who have certain things that they've got to go and do at sea, and we've done that, and we will continue to do that until the government boats are back out to sea. Yeah, there's been a whiff of scandal around this for quite a while now, but it seems to me that perhaps uh, it's a, bit, a little bit harshly treated by the press. Do you have a good relationship with the government? Uh, it's got better. It's got better. I think uh, there was a time where we, we struggled to communicate with each other, but certainly over the last year or so, the, the communication channels have become more open. Uh, I, I suppose, you know, in our, our position as industry and government, we have to continue talking, uh, and, and it has got better over the last few years. After the break, which is in a couple of minutes' time, we're going to talk about, about other things. Uh, we'll talk about consumer trends, because what interests me is the fact that you say as people grow in wealth, they, uh, they tend to consume more protein. I would contend that perhaps you're going to have to change your brands in favour of something that is uh, more aspirational. When I look at Lucky Star, I think cheap protein, good stuff and uh, it's good for the lower income groups. But as mm -hmm. a middle class emerges, don't you think it's going to change? It will change, uh, and, and that change, we've started to see it happen to a degree, uh, and we have reacted to it, and as I indicated to you before, mm. I'm a fisherman, not a marketeer, but certainly our marketing guys have, uh, we've, we've put on what we call the blue can range, where we, Lucky Star is iconic and red and yellow, and we have a premium range, which is our blue can range, and that involves species like tuna and mussels and salmon, and those are taking our brand into the higher LSMs, and we've seen some good traction on that. So you're buying in the fish and then packaging it on, on, on your own behalf, if you like? On certain of our canned mm. ranges, yes. We don't, we don't harvest tuna for canning, for example, so we will, we will go and procure that around the world. And we've seen that not only in, in, in the premium ranges, the blue can range, but also in our normal red can range, our Lucky Star Pulsheds themselves, 
we, our market has grown to a point where we cannot satisfy market demand with the production that comes out of South Africa and Namibia. And so for a number of years now, we've gone global with the procurement. And so we are, we are buying in fish in Morocco, in Mauritania, Mexico, the USA and Japan. And we take that fish either back to our canneries here in South Africa or Namibia or subcontract with canneries in Thailand to convert that and can that fish and then we bring it back to satisfy market demand here in South Africa. Okay.